Jesus of Nazareth. He was the firstborn son of Mary and Joseph. And I had heard stories of how there was no room for them in the inn. Mary would say it was a woman's worst nightmare as she began her labor pains. Certainly, a stable was not a place that any woman would have imagined giving birth. But there was something special about Jesus, she said. Even the labor pains themselves, Mary said, were a mixture of pain and hope right until the moment he was born. And Jesus, he would cry like any other baby. But Mary knew that something special had occurred when some ruddy shepherds came running into the stable and they knelt down and they were speaking of angels and they worshiped her baby boy. Jesus was always a boy of very humble beginnings. And even though many would worship him, Many would fall at his feet. Many would desire just to reach the hem of his garment. Many would cry out to him for mercy. He would always be found in the place that was last, coming not to be served, but to serve a servant for us all. That was Jesus' beginning. And while I wasn't there at that moment, I feel like I could have witnessed it myself, having heard it so many times. Though when I met Jesus, I was not myself. I was in a prison, so to speak. I was stuck in a cycle of pain that would not leave. My mind was not my own. My body was not my own. And unlike Jesus' mother, my pain seemingly had no hope. I was bound seven times over by demons that tortured me, and I was lost among them. But as so many of us here have come to this meeting of Jesus, many of us would speak of that moment when we met Jesus. We would say, he touched me. And from that moment on, I was free. I can't really put it into words. I can't really express what it's like to be freed, not once or twice even, but seven times over in a mere moment. But I found myself at shalom. I found myself at peace for the very first time in my life. I had been bound for so long, I had forgotten who I was. I had forgotten who this Mary of Magdala was. Jesus was kind to me, and he taught me many things about myself. And in this freedom that he gave me, I chose to give it all up to follow him, to make Jesus my master and my Lord and my Savior. Following Jesus, I would hear those three words over and over. He touched me. It seemed to be the witness of everyone who followed Jesus. I heard them over and over and over. He touched me, said the blind man. He touched me, said the lame. He touched me, said the lepers, the lonely. Many of us freed from illness or demons or just simply the bondage of life itself. We followed Jesus because he saved us. Sharing with one another that amazing moment when he touched our lives And he changed us forever. But today, we gather. And we are struck by the horror we witnessed yesterday. We're left confused and bewildered. 
the death of this son of man, the death of the one who touched us. He changed us and saved us from those very own pits of despair. Yet true to who Jesus was, I witnessed him hanging, dying, nailed to a cross, and asking for forgiveness of those who were murdering him. And in the words of Jesus himself while he was with us, he said, and he lived, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you and bless those who curse you and pray for those who mistreat you. You see, we must go on. We must continue to serve even when he is no longer here. We must let the words and actions of Jesus live on in our hearts and in our lives and in all that we do. Love all, help the poor, serve all, walk humbly. And if you are among the ones that Jesus touched, if he's changed your life, if you bear witness to that, then you know. And if you know, then you must never let what Jesus has done for you die. Again, remember the words of Jesus Do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Today we honor Jesus, friend of sinners, by living his words in our life and taking up his yoke, which is easy and light and we continue to bear witness to that moment when we met Jesus in our lives that moment when he touched us and that moment when he changed us Jesus I wrote that eulogy, as you may have imagined, is from the perspective of Mary Magdalene in the Bible. The truth is, we all ought to consider our own eulogy for Jesus. And in fact, I'm give you give you an opportunity to write a eulogy at the end of the service today. A eulogy is a speech given after the death of someone, and it is generally given by someone who knows and loves the person who has died. And I thought Mary, well, she definitely fit that description. You know, Mary, she was always there. When you read in scripture, (laughs) you just see her quietly, silently in the background of so many scriptures supporting Jesus and his ministry. He, she is one of the few people who witness his death, his burial, and his resurrection. Mary was a dedicated and loving disciple, wasn't she? And I hope that you yourself find yourself in that same description as well, as one who knows and loves Jesus. We are in part two of our series on the gospel. The last message we talked about how Jesus has come right? We had our gender reveal party, remember that? (laughs) And uh, we talked about how Jesus um, 
has come. We, we were focused was on the birth announcement of Jesus, that Jesus is God himself in the flesh sent here to the earth to bring hope to this world, that he is um, what the Bible calls the long-awaited Messiah, that he fulfills the prophecies from the Old Testament. We talked about those, and that he is the one who will come and reconcile us to God. He is the one spoken about in Genesis, the one who will crush the head of our enemy, right? But this week, we're talking about Jesus and his death. Our focus is on the eulogy. You see, as we spread the good news that we are called to, this gospel, which is called the good news, we are to remember not only that Christ has come, that hope has come, but we also have to focus on that Christ has died and that hope has died and that his death was here for a purpose. Now bear with me as I bring the message of the gospel piece by piece, okay? Many of us, we enjoy the fullness and the completeness of the gospel, and we often want to rush ahead to Jesus is alive, and Jesus is coming again, and we'll get there. (laughs) But as painful it is, we need to stop right here at this moment and recognize the death of Jesus and what all that was for. So today our focus is Jesus has died. So why did Jesus die, right? Isn't that the first question everybody wants to ask? I mean, the painful truth is that Jesus dies because he loves us. He comes because he loves us. John three sixteen says, For God so loved the world that he sent his one and only Son. You see, he came to the earth because God, as God, cannot die. So God, at some point, had to become fully, completely flesh to die. Martin Luther says it like this. He says that as God, he could not die. So he became man in order to die, right? Because God cannot die, right? Because he is omnipotent, he's omnipresent, he's forever, right? He cannot die. Um, So he had to become fully human in order to do that. And on the cross, he accepted the sin of man against himself as a perfectly innocent man. He accepted the injustice of man against man. That's what Martin Luther says. John the Baptist says this, Jesus is the Lamb of God. Remember that at the baptism? John the Baptist says, here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So what does that mean? You see, since the birth of sin, sacrifice has been the result. And when we read in Genesis between Adam and Eve, we find that Adam and Eve sin, and the first thing God does, thank you. The first thing that God does when sin happens is sacrifice occurs. And the sacrifice is an animal, and he uses the hide, the skin of the animal, to cover Adam and Eve. He, <clears throat> that, that sacrifice literally covers their body. And because of that, that is sort of a, um, a foreshadowing of Jesus to come. But somehow there is this rule, if there is sin, then there must be sacrifice. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. So there is a price for sin that is death, and a price that needs to be paid. In the moment Adam and Eve sinned, there was a price. And in that point, they should have paid it, right? But they didn't. God put another in the place. And so right from the very beginning, we see the grace of God in our lives, the love of God, not to make us pay that price, that terrible price. But see, the prerequisite to accepting this truth is to become acquainted with our own sin, isn't it? I mean, what difference does it make 
if we don't know we're sinful. To know that we are a people that need saving. To know that personally we cannot live perfect enough to be in the presence of a holy and righteous God. Um, if you read in the Bible, Daniel and John, they both get a glimpse into the throne room of heaven, and around the throne room are angels. And what are they saying about God over and over? Who knows? Holy, 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 holy is the Lord God Almighty, holy. That You see, God is holy. There is no question about that. He is without any fault. He is holy. He is perfect. And when we look at ourselves in stark contrast, we are not. Trust me, nobody's going to be crying that about me, okay? <laughs> I, in stark contrast, am not holy. That is not a word that you could use to describe me. Only God himself is holy. And so when we think about what Christ did on the cross and we think about sin, we have to be at a place in our lives where we know that we are sinful, Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And then the next part is the best part. And are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Only through Jesus. God presented him, Jesus, as a sacrifice of atonement. Through faith in his blood, he makes amends for the sin that has occurred in our life because Jesus came. 1 John 1 8 says, If we claim to be without sins, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So basically, we lie. <laughs> okay? If we say, Hey, I have never done anything wrong in my entire life, we are a liar. But. The Bible says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So let's be honest for a moment. Can we be honest with one another, all of us, for this, this brief moment right here? If you would say that you are not holy and that you have sinned, and have done things wrong, either in deed or in thought, raise your hand. We all have, haven't we? We've all done things that are not holy. Things that we would not want to put alongside a holy God. Whew, we would not want to do that. <clears throat> but Jesus' death wasn't exactly for sin he didn't die because of our sin it wasn't sin that held him to the cross it was his love for us it was his love for sinners his love for you and me jesus died because he loves us i used to think that every time i did something wrong i murdered jesus I did. As a young child, I often thought that. I mean, that was how I thought it. Every time I did something wrong, I thought I murdered Jesus. I always thought that, that it was my sins themselves that just murdered him, and I felt horribly guilt-ridden over all of that. But, you know, I read in Mark chapter 2 a story that I find quite interesting. It's about the paraplegic man. You guys remember that? Uh, the man who, he's paraplegic, so he can't move his arms and legs. And he has four friends who bring him to Jesus, right? So you got to love this story. First of all, I love this account because I could just imagine, first of all, this guy who can't move. He must have been a good guy, though. He's got four friends who are willing to take him where he wants to go. He wants to go see Jesus, right? So he's got four friends who like him. And he must have really wanted to see Jesus badly because Jesus is preaching. And he's like at a house type thing. And the crowd is gathered around. And they can't get anywhere close to Jesus. And it just takes four guys to come up with this conclusion. <laughs> They're like, there are people to the east, to the north, to the south, 
hey, nobody's above them, <laughs> right? And so they thought, hey, we'll take them over to the roof, right? We'll climb up on the roof. And the poor paraplegic guy, man, I just, he had faith right then and there when he said, okay, guys, right? <laughs> and so he said, all right, so four guys climb up on the roof, cut a hole in the roof, which doesn't seem to me like that would be very stable. <laughs> and they let him down right in front of Jesus. And the first thing Jesus says to him is he says, your sins are forgiven. This obviously paraplegic man, right? And I'm sure everybody expected him to just heal him like that. So he says, your sins are forgiven. And Jesus demonstrates a power that they hadn't ever imagined. Your sins are forgiven. That Jesus has the ability to just say, your sins are forgiven. And then they're forgiven. And that always pauses me to cause and question. You know, if Jesus can just forgive sins, then why did he have to die? Couldn't he just proclaim over the whole world and every person that wanted to have their sins forgiven? Because we do have to ask for forgiveness, right? That he would say, all your sins are forgiven. And then just enter into heaven without having to die at all. I mean, can't he just forgive us? And we can just go to God? And I find myself saying, well, yeah, Jesus can forgive us if we confess, if we come to him. But forgiveness of sins is not the same as defeat of sin. And we know that God can defeat sin. I mean, if God cannot defeat sin, then how can he be God at all, right? If he can't defeat evil, then he's not a real God, right? Because a God is supposed to be omnipotent, all-powerful. That's what we claim our God to be. So if he is that, then he's more powerful than sin. So why can't he just defeat sin like that? God can forgive, but forgiveness isn't enough. He has to destroy and defeat sin. And I can't help but think of the analogy of throwing out the baby with the bathwater. You know what I mean? Because if God destroyed sin and overcame sin, it would have led to the death of each and every one of us because there is sin in us, right? There is a cost to sin. There is a price. And death is the price. And God wasn't willing to get rid of all of us just to defeat sin in that moment. The price for sin is not just a physical death, but it is a spiritual death as well. It is a death that separates us from life itself from life in God. See, inside God, there is life and light. And outside of God, there is darkness and death. And the two forever, eternally separated. In the moment sin entered, that moment, the enemy stole something from us. It was our destiny. It was life with God. The enemy took what we were bound for. You see, we had a destiny that said that we would spend forever with God. And when the enemy brought sin into our lives and we fell into that trap, he stole that very destiny from us. And he's been holding it ransom since the beginning. And Jesus himself says he has come to pay the price to pay the ransom to get our destiny back. Mark 20, 45. These are Jesus's words. He says, the son of man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus describes his death as a payment for something that has been stolen, kidnapped, held hostage. And I tell you, that is our destiny. 
But in Jesus' death, we find that he pays that ransom for us. He gets our destiny back. Not just death of his body, but he suffers a death of his relationship with God. Sin separates us from God, and death in its very simple description means separation. And Jesus experienced that anguish, so we don't have to. We hear his words on the cross. He says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He doesn't call him Father, but at that moment, he calls him God as a full human, all human, words that you and I will never ever have to experience, words we will never ever have to utter or express that God would ever forsake us because Christ allowed himself to experience that for us. And when we look at the cross, when we see that we no longer have to go through everything that jesus went on the cross was a price he paid that we no longer have to pay every cry of anguish every nail every drop of blood you see what lies on the cross in the very end is a dead fully human being entirely separated from god forever and when that happens the whole creation cries out. There is lightning. There is a storm. There's an earthquake. There is darkness over the whole world for one human. Can you imagine the death of every human? Can you imagine? And it's terrifying to think that creation would cry out. You see, in the death of Jesus, we recognize that there is a freight train of death that is headed right for each one of us. It is the result of sin. And Jesus, out of his compelling love for us, God sends him, and he doesn't just push us out of the way of that freight train. Instead, he stands in the path of the train for us because somebody has to pay the price. Because someone has to stop the train of death and destruction. And Jesus' cry from the cross is just that. When he says, it is finished, that is exactly what has happened. Death and destruction no longer is headed for us. Death has been paid. The price has been satisfied when Jesus dies on that cross. This is God loving us. This is God making a way. Jesus' words were, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus' death is the greatest act of love. Jesus says, greater love hath no man than this, that he would lay down his life for another. Jesus' words, Jesus' life, Jesus' love for you and for me. So as we stand before the cross today, we have a eulogy to write. It is our witness to what Christ has done for us. It is probably the most powerful witness you and I can ever give. It is our personal experience. It is our Jesus touched me moment. And like Mary freed seven times over, I know that God has come time after time after time in my life. And he has saved me from my selfishness and my pride and my sins and the temptations and my failures and my sickness. And his grace and his mercy never, ever ends. See, I am a sinner. You are a sinner. But we're not just any sinner. We're a sinner that is ransomed. We are a sinner that is loved with the greatest love of all. A sinner touched by the most powerful force in the world, more powerful than a freight train of death because God is stronger than death and God is love and it is his love for you and for me. And when we look upon the cross, we see that our sins are conquered by this very same love. We see that our destiny is returned to us. 
we see that our lives are reconciled with a holy and righteous God. You see, on the scales of eternity, love outweighs sin every single time. And just as, sin, just as true that sin caused death, the truth is that love destroys death. And so as we consider our eulogy, we consider what we have been ransomed from, and we consider the ways that God displays it to us in our lives, <clears throat> that he has given us back in eternity with him.